James chapter 4, beginning tonight with verse 6. The word but is a disassociative conjunction. So it's always a contrasting kind of a thing. In verse 4, James talks about them being adulterers and adulteresses, and that is in a spiritual sense, because they were trying to make friendship with the world, but he's telling them that that's enmity with God. And do you think the scripture says in vain that the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? So in contrast with that old life in the flesh, sort of attracted by the world, in contrast to that, where we oftentimes find ourselves caught up in that position, he giveth more grace, but he giveth more grace. Grace has been defined as God's unmerited favor. Blessings that God bestows upon us just because he loves us. You did nothing to earn them. They are not rewards for anything that you have done. God just loves you and delights to bless you. It is by grace that you've been saved, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's interesting that the very first place that the word grace is mentioned in the Bible is at the time of Noah. And there, the scripture tells us, God saw the wickedness of man. It was great in the earth. And every imagination and thought was only evil continually, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so that's the first mention of grace in the Bible. But it's mentioned throughout the Bible, and it is interesting that the very last verse in the Bible, Revelation 22, 21, the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So first and last mentions are always interesting in the Bible when you're studying a particular word or topic. I'd like to give you some thoughts on grace from William Newell's commentary on the book of Romans. I'll be adding some of my own comments, but this is basically what he teaches there in chapter 6 in the book of Romans concerning grace, the nature of grace. Grace is God acting freely according to his own nature of love with no promises or obligations to fulfill and acting, of course, righteously in view of the cross. Grace, therefore, is uncaused in the recipient. Its cause lies wholly in the giver, that is God. Grace also is sovereign, not having any debts to pay, any fulfilled condition on man's part to wait for. It can act toward whom and how it pleases, it can and does often place the worst deservers in the highest favors. This was a real problem to me in my Christian life growing up because I did grow up in sort of a legalistic kind of a background where that I felt I had to earn God's blessings. And my righteousness was sort of predicated on the fact that 
I didn't go to shows, I didn't go to dances, I didn't smoke cigarettes, I, um, you know, did all of the things that the church said I should do. I attended faithfully every service the church was open. I paid my tithes. And these were the things that I was depending on to receive favors from God. Sort of like I deserve it. Sort of like, God, you owe it to me. Because look how, you know, righteous I am. But what problemed me and what became a real problem in my Christian life is that I could look around and I could see fellows that I knew, friends of mine. I knew that they were sneaking off and going to shows. I knew that they were, you know, smoking a cigarette now and then. And yet they seemed to have blessings of God that I desired and did not receive. And I thought, how can this be? <laughs> you know, those guys are cheating. And, you know, they're, they're not living a, a really consistent life. And Look how God seems to bless them, and here I am, Mr. Good Boy, and, <laughs> you know, just wishing I had those things that they were getting from God. And it did really create a real problem for me in my early Christian life, how it was that I did not receive, it seems, the same kind of blessings that they received when I knew that they were doing things that weren't really right. I discovered as years went by and I really began to discover the grace of God that the problem was I was coming to God on the basis of my righteousness in order to receive from him. As though God did owe me one because of some special thing that I had done for him. And expecting God to bless me as sort of a reward, sort of I've earned it. And, and because I was coming to God on that basis, he gave me what I deserved, nothing. <laughs> and it wasn't until I began to understand the nature of God's grace. He didn't owe me anything. He doesn't owe me anything. And, and I can't really come to God and ask on the basis of, well, God, you know, Look how good I've been, surely you should. But I learned to come to God on the basis of, God, you love me. I don't deserve that love. And Lord, because you love me, I know you want to bless me. And I know I don't deserve those blessings, but Lord, go ahead anyhow. <laughs> React and respond according to your grace. And I learned to believe God for the blessings, though I knew I didn't deserve them. And, and what a difference that made. You see, as long as I was seeking the blessings of God based upon my righteousness, I just didn't receive much. But when I discovered that the blessings were bestowed by grace, just trusting God to bless me because he loves me, the blessings have never ceased. They just keep coming. In saying all of that, I think that we need to get the balance on that, though. John said in his first, it was Jude that said it in his little epistle. 
He said, keep yourself in the love of God. That is, keep yourself in a relationship with God so that God can do all of the wonderful things for you that he desires to do because he loves you. But keep yourself in that place. Uh, years ago, when I first began in the ministry, just out of Bible college, before I met Kay, I knew I wasn't really qualified to pastor as a young single fellow. So I went out as an evangelist. And I went back into the uh, Ozarks and was holding some meeting in churches back there. And they had uh, the old Stamps Baxter hymnals uh, and very homey, homey songs, homey hymnals. Uh, and I, I used to like to just go through the hymnals, thumb through them, and read the titles of the songs because they were just such homey songs. I can remember one title, Tell Her Now She Can't Read Her Tombstone When She's Dead. <laughs> well, that's practical. That's, that's just good advice, you know. But I remember another hymn, and it was, I'm under the spout where the glory comes out. And that's basically what John is saying. Keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself under the spout where the glory comes out. Keep yourself in that kind of a relationship with God that he can do the things for you that he desires to do. God wants to bless you. God wants to just lavish his love upon you. But sometimes God in his love withholds the blessings that he wants to bestow because he knows the position that you are in spiritually that those blessings could hurt your spiritual walk. And rather than give things that could be a detriment to you, he would withhold them because you wouldn't really be capable of, of handling it and, and still maintain that relationship with God. Y your eyes would be turned to the, the things that God was giving to you and and you would soon stray from him. And so in his love, he just withholds those blessings that he would love to bestow, wants to bestow, but knows that it could do damage to your relationship with him. If blessings would turn your heart from him, he will withhold those blessings of grace. If prosperity would destroy you, he will hold back Prosperity. Getting back to William Newell's commentary on Romans, grace cannot act where there is either deserving or ability. Grace doesn't help. It is absolute. It does it all. Therefore, being no cause in the creature why grace should be shown, the creature must be brought off from trying to give God cause for his grace. And, and, and that's one thing that people commonly do. And, and that is, uh, they try to give God cause to bestow his grace. Or you try to obligate God uh, to bestow his grace upon you. There can be no cause in the believer why grace should be shown. God will withhold his blessings if they are harmful. Therefore, flesh 
has no place in the plan of grace. This is the great reason why God is hated by the proud natural mind of man. But the true believer rejoices, for he knows that in him, that is in his flesh, there dwells no good thing, yet he finds God's desires to bless him just as he is totally deserving and unworthy. I love that. The place of man under grace. Well, he's been accepted in Christ, who is his standing. He's not on probation. As to his past life, it does not exist before God. He died with Christ on the cross, and Christ is now his life. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away. Everything becomes new. So my past life does not exist as far as God is concerned. My lineage no longer goes back to Adam. It was from Adam that I received the nature of sin. But the old man, that man whose nature was sinful, was crucified with Christ. I need to see Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins, for he paid the price. But I need to see myself on the cross with Christ in order to see the real life of victory that God wants for me, no longer living after the flesh but now living after the Spirit, crucified with Christ. Know ye not that the old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin should no longer reign as king over you. So that seeing yourself crucified with Christ is so important. The failure of devotion does not cause the withdrawal of bestowed grace, as it would be under the law. The proper attitude of man under grace is, first of all, to believe and consent to be loved while unworthy. And that's a great secret. Just to accept God's love, though I know I don't deserve it. I have found one of the greatest problems is to accept grace gracefully. We get so clumsy when someone does something special and bestows upon us some benefit or blessing, and, and to accept it gracefully is a difficult thing. And, and with God, the blessings of God, to accept them gracefully I, I oftentimes say, oh, God, that's so wonderful. I'll, I'll, I'll sure, you know, show you that I, you know, am deserving or whatever, you know. And here I'm, I'm trying to get my fleshly kind of stuff in there rather than just say, oh, God, you're so good. You're so good. The proper attitude is to refuse to make any resolutions and vows. And, and that is what we so often do when we want something from God. We promise God, if you will do this for me, then this is what I'll do for you. And we're trying to, let's make a deal with God. Uh, rather than just accept the goodness and the blessings of God. And without making vows or resolutions. To expect to be blessed, though realizing more and more my lack of worthiness to be blessed. To testify of God's goodness at all times. And to be certain of God's future favor, yet to be ever more tender in conscience toward him and to rely on God's chastening hand as the mark of his kindness. 
talking with a fellow going through some really serious problems right now. And I said, well, that's wonderful. It shows God loves you. <laughs> Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. I mean, he's got you in the, you know, in the shed and he's really whooping you, but. <laughs> it's for your benefit. It's showing you God loves you. Things that gracious souls discover. For you to hope to be better is to fa fail to see yourself complete in Christ. Do you know you can't improve on your righteousness? Isn't it interesting how we always say, well, I'm going to do better? You know, uh, New Year's is coming. Oh, great. We're going to make our resolution. We're going to do better this new year. But that's to fail to see that you are complete in Christ. The, the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you by your faith in him. You can't do more than that. You can't do better than that. And, and for us to try to improve on it really is sort of denigrating to the fact that God has accounted me righteous through Christ and it's complete. We are complete in him. To be disappointed in yourself only proves that you were trusting in yourself. <laughs> you thought that you were better than you really are. <laughs> and that's why you're disappointed. Because, you know, if you really acknowledge I have, am nothing, you know, and then you're not really disappointed when you stumble. Uh, it just proves that you were trusting in yourself. To be discouraged is unbelief in God's purpose and plan of blessing you. God purposes to bless me. To be proud is to be blind because we have absolutely no standing before God in ourselves. And then, this is an important one, the lack of divine blessing, therefore, comes from unbelief and not from a failure of devotions. Because real devotions and praise do not rise from man's desire to demonstrate devotion and praise. I used to, in the church that I grew up in, often hear them say, let's all stand and praise the Lord that we might receive a blessing from God today. God inhabits the praises of his people. So let's praise the Lord that he might bless our assembly today. And people would stand up and praise the Lord with the purpose of soliciting the blessing of God because we were praising him. Sort of, again, twisting God's arm. The truest praise is that which rises spontaneously from my heart. It isn't something that is Choreographed. It isn't something that is directed. But it is something that rises from my heart spontaneously at the recognition of God's love and goodness to me when he just bestows upon me some blessing just after maybe I have sort of failed in an area, and I think, oh, my, here I am, a failure again. And then God bestows some special blessing, and I say, oh, Lord, you're so good. I can't believe it, you know. That's the truest form of praise, that which rises spontaneously 
at the recognition of God's undeserved blessings that he bestows upon me. To preach devotion first and blessing second is to reverse God's order. It's to preach law and not grace. The law made your blessings dependent upon your devotions. Grace confers undeserved and unconditional blessings that provoke devotion and praise. So if you try and, you know, go devotions first in order to get praises, you got the cart before the horse. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our faith has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full, full giving has only begun because his love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. So, as James tells us here, he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resist the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. My problem growing up, I had spiritual pride. I looked around and I thought I was more spiritual than the rest of them. And it was a spiritual pride and it kept me from the blessings that God wanted to bestow upon me because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Where does God say that? Well, he says it back in Proverbs 3.34. Surely he scorns the scorners, but he gives grace to the lowly. The James is quoting from that, but James is quoting from the Septuagint uh, translation of the Old Testament. And of course, Peter also quotes it in 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, if God tells you something one time, you ought to believe it. But if he tells you twice, then you ought to doubly believe it. <laughs> he resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Pride and humility are in contradistinction to each other. God hates pride. Proverbs 6.16, six things the Lord hates, and seven are an abomination to him. And leading the things that God hates, top of the list of things that God hates, is a proud look. That feeling that you are better than someone else. In Matthew 23, 12, Jesus said, He that exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. In a few verses down, probably right after the first of the year, we'll come to the 10th verse where James said, humble yourselves therefore in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. God resists the proud. If you are proud, it means that God is against you. I don't know about you, but I really can't afford God resisting me. 
But in contrast to that, he does just acknowledge and bless the humble. James, verse 7, said, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. He resists the proud, so don't fight that. Resist. Don't be God resisting you, but just uh, submit yourself to God. And the true work of God's spirit in your life will never lead you to arrogancy or to pride, but it is always a humbling experience whenever God uses you for his purposes. It's a humbling experience. To tell me that God is sovereign, he has absolute control over my life, and everything that transpires in my life would absolutely terrify me. If there is some great power that's in control of my life and everything that happens to me, and, and it's all you know something that I have, I, I can't resist it, terrifying. And thus, just the teaching of the sovereignty of God is sort of a terrifying doctrine But unless I know that God loves me supremely and he only desires what is best for me, then rather than being terrified, I rejoice. I rejoice that God loves me and is in control of everything that happens to me. And it gives me confidence. It gives me a rest. It it, it takes away worry and fears and things of that nature. It's all under his control. If it's happened, he's allowed it to happen. If he's allowed it to happen, then he has a good purpose for it happening. It's for my good. And that's exactly what Paul tells us. All things are working together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. So don't let the doctrine of the sovereignty of God terrify you. Find comfort and strength in it. Because God is in control, but he loves you. I would have great difficulty submitting to some sovereign, irresistible, impersonal power. I would find myself rebelling and resisting that. But knowing that he is all wise, all gracious, all loving, he loves me supremely. He only desires what's best for me. I find that very easy to submit to God. I want to submit fully to him. And I would consider it rather foolish and stupid not to. If God only wants the best for me, then my resisting him would be completely foolish, foolhardy. So, Half of a truth can frighten you, the sovereignty of God. But the whole truth brings comfort and assurance. I'm going to save this next one because I do believe that it, the latter part of verse 7, I think, really ties in with the first part of verse 8. And there's just so much I want to say on this one where James says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. But in contrast, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. We'll save that for the next lesson. Father, how we thank you for that love that you have for us. And how we thank you for your grace by which you have bestowed upon us so many blessings. Lord, our cup overflows because of your grace pouring out unto us not just a full cup, but overflowing our cup of life. 
And so, Lord, tonight, as we are here, help us, Lord, to grasp this knowledge of your grace and what grace is all about and what it means to us and what it does for us. Lord, remove from us any pride. Remove from us any endeavor or attempt on our part to obligate you to bless us. But Lord, may we just believe and trust you to bless because you want to. Though we recognize and know, Lord, we don't deserve, but yet we rejoice. Bless tonight, Lord, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The pastors are down here at the front. Maybe you do need a special blessing from the Lord. They're here to pray for you. We would encourage you to come on forward as soon as we're dismissed. Shall we all stand? I will serve you. Because I love you, you have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lives are why you die. Calvary, your touch is what I long for. You have given life to me. You have given life to me. God bless you.